Sometimes in life you get a pleasant little bonus that you weren't expecting, whether it's finding a forgotten fiver in the pocket of your favourite jeans, seven nuggies instead of six in your extra value meal, or the takeaway sending a free portion of vegetable spring rolls with your duck chow mein. It really is lovely when something nice is made even nicer by a little surprise. It goes without saying then that it really is a splendid treat when you drop your hard-earned pennies on a great video game and then find that it also contains a smaller but still brilliant game within it. For this list, we're looking at the mini-games or side games included with our favourite titles that really are the cherry on top of their respective digital Sundays. We won't be including the likes of Animal Crossing or Uncharted 4, which let you play other pre-existing video games within them, though those might deserve a nice shiny list of their own someday. With all that in mind, I'm Ben from Triple Jump, concealing a slightly smaller but equally great Ben from Triple Jump, and here are 10 brilliant games within video games. Number 10. Beatlemania – Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars it was Leonardo da Vinci who said, Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, and whilst he probably didn't have a mustachioed Italian plumber in mind when he imparted this bit of wisdom, it's impossible to deny its relevance when it comes to Super Mario RPG's Beatlemania. When our plucky, overall-wearing hero returns to the Mushroom Kingdom following the whole fracas in Marymoor, he'll come across Beatlemania Toad. Upon first, second, and even third interaction, the Wii Mushroom will tell Mario to wait, but bother him a fourth time time, and he'll offer to sell you Beatlemania for just 500 coins. I may not be David Dickinson, but I know a bargain when I see one. Once your transaction is complete, head on over to the menu and get to blasting those Cooper shells. Careful though, if any of them hit you, you're going to lose a life, and let too many of them strike your tiny beetle body and it's game over. There's really not all that much point to Beatlemania beyond trying to get the best high score, but it's a great little piece of mindless fun that will at the very least provide a welcome distraction from having to save Princess Toadstool again. Number 9. Cubed – Grand Theft Auto 4 As a huge fan of the English language and linguistics in general, I'm mildly affronted that I'm expected to pronounce this minigame as cubed and not quub 3D, but I'll let it slide on account of how hugely addictive it is. Just this one's Rockstar. Not dissimilar to Japanese tile-matching game Puyo Puyo, Cubed is a nifty little arcade title that can be found in a number of locations across Liberty City, offering young Nico Bellic a bit of respite from running over pedestrians and leaving his cousin on red. I don't I don't want the bowling! It's really quite a simple premise. Maneuver pairs of cubes around a grid and attempt to match the colours in groups of four. It really is that easy. If you're very good, you can even earn special moves that can do everything from stopping the blocks to wiping out entire rows, columns, or colours. And if you're into those sweet, sweet achievements, you're going to want to have a bash at beating the developer's high score of 10,950 points if you're interested. And yes, doing so is necessary for 100% completion. Sorry about that. Number 8. Dead Ops Arcade – Call of Duty Black Ops the Zombies modes featured in various Call of Duty titles have been fan favourites ever since players got to experience Nacht der Untoten, or Night of the Living Dead if you want to get Google Translate about this, in 2008 World at War. Each instalment of the Shooty Shooty America Flip Yeah franchise has brought something new to the Zombies feature, with expanded maps, bigger and better perks, and even the opportunity to helicopter the heck out of there, but nothing has come quite so far out of left field as Dead Ops Arcade, included with 20 2010's Call of Duty Black Ops, or COD Blops for short. The overall premise is reasonably similar to its predecessors. Survive wave after wave of undead spooky boys, pick up weapons and power-ups, and try not to die. Rather than being a first-person shooter, however, Dead Ops Arcade gets the top-down treatment, with players able to face off against their cerebrally challenged foes while enjoying a delightfully nostalgic 8-bit soundtrack and an all-you-can-eat ammo buffet. <laughs> Yummy. Much like the Game of Thrones, you win or you die, or you give up in the eighth season. But if you do manage to make it through all 40 levels unscathed, you have the chance to show down against the final boss, Cosmic Silverback. Beat him, and I reckon you've earned yourself a very big cup of tea. Go on, you mad lad. Have a custard cream, you've earned it. All two! <laughs> Slow down. Number 7. Red Menace. Fallout 4. 
Now, I don't want to say that Red Menace is a Donkey Kong ripoff. However, had it been released pre-nuclear apocalypse, Nintendo would have been suing vault Tech quicker than you could say copyright strike. Thank God for that atomic bomb. <laughs> Am I right? Serving to parody the aforementioned gorilla and his many japes, Red Menace can be found on the recreation terminal in the cafeteria of Vault 111, along with a reminder that the game is a privilege that will be revoked if work performance declines. Hmm, perhaps need a similar notice in the Triple Jump office. I've got my eye on you, James. No more arc. In order to defeat the Red Menace, the player must traverse the levels, climb up whatever ladders haven't been destroyed, and collapse the roof on that communist swine. They are people, though. Sadly, it's not as easy as I've made it sound on account of the fact that the eponymous anthropomorphic Chinese flag keeps flinging barrels and nuclear missiles in your direction. If you do manage all of that and come out the other side with nary a scratch, you'll be rewarded with a whole load of smooches from Vault Girl. Ooh la la, is what it says here. Number 6. Quarkvid Comics. Ratchet and Clank, up your arsenal. It's been the best part of two decades since Ratchet & Clank 3 made its debut on the PS2, and I still haven't forgiven whoever's responsible for the fact that the European release was missing its Up Your Arsenal subtitle, which is, in our humble writer's opinion at least, nothing short of the finest name in gaming history. Unlike many of the other entries on this list, the Quarkvid comics actually serve a purpose when it comes to the game's main narrative. Upon discovering that the somewhat inept Captain Quark has gone mad and is living feral, our titular heroes crack out the first of several vid comics, restoring the quirky captain's memory in the process. The vid comics themselves are 2D side-scrolling platformers, each weaving a tale from Quark's past life, from his heroic defeat of Captain Blackstar and a band of robotic pirate ghosts to his vanquishing of Dr. Nefarious and a whole load of angry insectoids. It's unclear to the player how reliable of a narrator Quark is, but the pinch of salt I'd recommend you'd take them with is likely to cause a coronary in even the healthiest of us. Number 5 with fire and sword, spiders. Observer. If forced to choose, I'd struggle to pick between a dystopian future in which a digital plague is an actual thing that can happen and being trapped in a series of caves with a bunch of giant spiders. Gun to my head, I'd take the plague. As it turns out, however, things have gotten so bad in 2084 Krakow that a stressful round of With Fire and Sword Spiders is considered a bit of respite. If you get sick of investigating grisly murders, you can kick back with this nifty little minigame and take your mind off things. <laughs> what? Those corpses aren't getting any deader, they'll wait. You control a pixelated knight tasked with saving a princess from a whole bunch of spiders. Sadly, this young lady is unwilling to let just anyone save her, so you're going to have to make bank on the way, collecting any gold coins you find while fending off spiders with a limited number of fire swords. It's incredibly frustrating when you fail, but very rewarding when you work out the exact moves needed to outsmart the annoying arachnids. As long as you end up with enough cash to impress the princess, that is. Number 4. Joustus, Shovel Knight, King of Cards. You know what I was saying earlier about my love for linguistics? Well, Shovel Knight, King of Cards teaches us a valuable lesson in the power of language and why it's incredibly important to choose your words carefully, especially when it comes to explaining rules. After deciding that he fancies the King of Cards moniker, King Knight sets off on a quest to defeat the three Joustus judges and claim the title for himself. Sadly, for the judges, they failed to specify that champions need to defeat them at the card game, and so King Knight proceeds to just beat them all senseless. Chalk it up to a lesson learned, eh, chaps? We're not really sure why King Knight felt the need to resort to physical violence, however, because Joustus is great fun. Players must strategically lay cards on a table in such a way that they can shove them about with other cards, with the ultimate goal of collecting as many gems as possible. Sounds fairly simple on paper, but it gets a lot more difficult when your opponent is shoving your cards about as well. Number 3. Liar's Dice – Red Dead Redemption If you enjoy dice and lying, then oh boy, do I have a game for you. Based on the real-world game of the same name, Liar's Dice requires players to use the same deductive and deceptive techniques of more complex games like Texas Hold'em, but strips away the need to remember ridiculous card combinations. Honestly, what on earth is a royal flush anyway? It sounds like something Prince Harry does after a heavy night on the Guinness. Is he a prince anymore? Oh, it doesn't matter. It's a 
simple enough game. Shake your dice cup, slam it down on the table, and then take a peek at the faces you've been dealt. Players bid on how many of a certain face they think there may be on the table, bluffing if they wish and calling out their opponents if they suspect tomfoolery is afoot. It may take a few rounds to get the hang of Liar's Dice, but once you do, you're going to find yourself burning through your Old West dollary dues quicker than you can say, actually most of the things they said in the Old West aren't fit for repeating today, but you get the point. Number 2. Triple Triad, Final Fantasy VIII and Final Fantasy XIV. Oh yeah, here we go, complicated card game time! I've played Triple Triad before. This is a whole other universe of confusing, and I've watched several YouTube videos of other people playing it. Even so, I'm going to give this everything I've got. First featured in 1999's Final Fantasy VIII and revived, much to the rejoice of fans, in 2013's Final Fantasy XIV, Triple Triad is a collectible card game played against a single opponent on a 3x3 grid. After a coin toss to decide who goes first, players must lay out their cards in turn, taking over their adversary's cards through the strategic use of bigger numbers. Except not always. Sometimes it's the same number, or several numbers added together. Look, there's a lot of rules, okay? Once you've had a good long cry and worked out how to actually play the thing, it's really quite enjoyable. Not only that, but the collectible element of Triple Triad means that you've got plenty of things to keep you busy whilst trying to expand your deck, whether it's seeking out vendors, winning cards from other people, or claiming them as a tournament prize. You know, if you've managed to finish all those other million things that Final Fantasy tasks you with doing, it is important though. Number 1. Gwent – The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt the Witcher 3 Wild Hunt is, in and of itself, a masterpiece, boasting a wonderfully engaging story, multi-dimensional characters, and more side quests than you can toss a coin at. Monster hunting is a pretty stressful pastime, however, so just occasionally you might wish to unwind with a nice bottle of Est Est and a couple of rounds of Gwent. Is that even how you pronounce that? I don't know. What is it? I haven't played the game, I should know. Begin the game by drawing a hand from your deck, then take it in turns to play cards with the ultimate goal of getting a better score than your opponent on a best of three basis. Pretty simple, right? Well it's a bit more strategic than that, because it's not just about having the highest value card, it's about the special cards you can roll out to absolutely trounce your adversary. You may be feeling quite smug with your tight bond catapults and your commander horn, but if your opponent has a torrential rain or, god forbid, a scorch up their sleeve, you're about to be in for a very upsetting afternoon. Not only is Gwent a great way to get your synapses firing for a few minutes, but it's also a fabulously addictive collectible card game. That's right, if you want that Geralt of Rivia card, you can't just buy it from some busty tavern wench nose. <laughs> you're gonna have to travel from village to village, challenging every Tom, Dick and Blacksmith you come across. Hello, random NPC whose entire family just died. Can I interest you in a game of Gwent in this troubling time? I can! Excellent! All I ask is that you don't get any tears on my Yennefer of Wengerberg card. Alright? Thanks, bud. Sorry about the, the family, though. 